Let's talk about nuclear reactions. Get out your science notebook. Here's the essential question. How does an atom change during nuclear reactions? Well, what is a nuclear reaction? As the name suggests, a nuclear reaction involves the nucleus of an atom, specifically a change to the nucleus of an atom. There are three main types of nuclear reactions we're going to cover in this presentation, so bear with me as I go through each and give you some examples. The first type is a radioactive decay. Now, radioactive decay relates to the unstable isotopes. When isotopes are unstable, it's typically because there's a, a not appropriate ratio of neutrons to protons. Either there's too many neutrons or too few neutrons to be able to stabilize that nucleus. Take a look at this nucleus right here, how unstable it is. It's kind of shaking around. Eventually, that nucleus will decay or break down and emit radiation. Now, radioactive decay actually has some useful uses. One type of radioactive isotope or radioisotope is carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is a natural isotope that is typically unstable, and it will decay over a period of time. The cool thing about it is, is it has a specified period of time that it decays, specifically 5,780 years. Now, we call that its half-life. And knowing the half-life of carbon-14 and the fact that it exists in living things allows us to date really old materials that have died off. Because these materials, after they die off, do not obtain any more carbon-14, we can see the ratio that they still have left and be able to tell how old they existed. Now, other elements do the same thing for other objects, which is really kind of cool. We can date many objects using the idea of radioactive isotopes. All right, try this practice. See if you can determine the number of each subatomic particle for carbon-14. Pause the video. All right, let me help you in case you need any help. I hope you pause the video and see if you figured it out yourself. But here is the isotope notation for carbon-14. Remember, 14 represents the mass of this particular isotope of carbon. Now, the mass typically has protons and neutrons in it, and protons, we can look on the periodic table to figure out how many protons carbon has, because it never changes, no matter what the isotope is. The rest of the mass is neutrons. In this case, there are eight neutrons and six protons. How about electrons? Well, electrons in this case are the same as protons. And that's because for a typical atom, atoms aren't typically charged. And electrons and protons cancel each other out. It doesn't specify a charge for this element, so we can assume that it does not have a charge. All right, the second type of nuclear reaction is a fission reaction. Now, this reaction has a lot of overlap with radioactive decay. You can see here that the definition is when a heavy nucleus splits into two or more stable nuclei and release lots of energy. For our case, that's kind of the main difference between radioactive decay and fission, is fission typically releases tons and tons and tons of energy, where radioactive decay may or may not release a lot of energy. So there's a lot of overlap between the two. We see, radio, we see fission inside nuclear power plants. In nuclear power plants, they use the isotope uranium-235, which is very unstable. And what happens is, is uranium-235 goes through a nuclear chain reaction to create lots of heat, and they use that heat to turn turbines and create steam inside nuclear power plants. So it's a great source of energy. All right, let's try this again. See if you could determine each subatomic particle and the isotope notation for uranium with 146 neutrons. Pause the video now and see if you can figure this one out yourself. Well, did you figure out that uranium on the periodic table is element number 92? Now, 92, that's 92 protons and 146 neutrons. That means that we have uranium 238. So this is a different isotope. This is a more natural isotope of uranium that we would find in nature. Now, uranium 238 is the most common uranium. Uranium-235 is what they use inside nuclear reactions. Now, in terms of electrons, 92 electrons to 92 protons because this uranium is not charged. 
All right, the last type of nuclear reaction is a fusion reaction. This is where we take low mass nuclei, typically two, and combine them to form heavier nuclei, to combine them to form more heavier and stable nucleus. And these also release lots of energy. So you can see here, here's two nuclei coming together and forming one nuclei. It might lose an extra neutron in the process, but it's only forming one nucleus here in this animation. We see this type of reaction inside the sun. In fact, there's a process called stellar nucleosynthesis. Stellar meaning sun, and then nucleosynthesis means to take the nuclei and fuse them together. Um, in the sun, hydrogen, like deuterium, hydrogen-2 and hydrogen-3 will come together, and it will fuse to make helium-4. That was actually the animation you saw in the previous video. But here we're taking two smaller nuclei, two hydrogens, fusing them together to, to make an even heavier nucleus, in this case, helium. Um, and again, it might lose a neutron in the process. That's not another nucleus. That's just an extra piece that goes off and becomes some other thing. Um, but it releases tons of energy in the process. All right, fission and fusion. Some students get these two things confused. I want to help you remember the two things, giving you other examples of things in real life with similar names. Now, you might know that the Earth sometimes splits apart and creates a fissure. Remember, fission and fissure are both related. It means splitting something apart. Now, fusion, we typically fuse wires together. It means to put them together. That's a way to remember fusion. And if you remember at least one of these two things, you can remember what the other one does. These are just real life examples of where those words are used elsewhere, not in chemistry. All right, the last thing I want to talk about is that both fission and fusion op obey really important laws of chemistry, the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of energy. Now, what are these two laws and what do we mean by that? Well, what happens is in both fission and fusion, the particles don't disappear in fission and fusion. Um, it might seem like that when they release tons of energy, like think of like few, like think of uh, atomic bombs. It seems like all these particles are just phasing out, but they're not. Either fission and fusion, particles are either changed into smaller or larger forms, but the mass is conserved. The mass has always been there and it always will be there. Now, how about energy? Same thing. Both reactions, fission and fusion, release stored energy. And that's, it's not that they're making energy out of nothing. The particles have energy in themselves. And we know this because of one of Einstein's equations, E equals mc squared. What that means is mass and energy have a direct relationship. E is the energy produced by the mass, which is m. And if you take m and multiply it by the speed of light squared, you get the amount of energy in there. So when fission and fusion happens, the energy released is because of things that have mass. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you know which one's going to release more energy? Is it fission or fusion? And I'm going to give you a hint with these pictures down here. Well, if you think about it, the sun releases a ton more energy than a nuclear power plant. And so fusion typically releases more energy than fission, but both obey the law of conservation of energy. All right, that's the end of the notes. Make sure to take some time and review these notes, highlight key terms. If you have any questions, make sure you write those down and seek answers to those questions and summarize your essential question. Good luck.